Good evening, and welcome to the 14th annual Frank K. Kelly Lecture on Humanity's Future. Uh, this lecture is a project of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. I'm David Krieger, I'm president of the foundation, and it's my pleasure to greet you tonight. I want to thank our sponsors for tonight's event. They're all listed in the program for the evening, so you can see who the sponsors are. But let me just uh, say a special thanks to the Santa Barbara Foundation and the Terry and Mary Kelly Foundation for being principal sponsors tonight. I also really want to thank all of you for being here and for caring about humanity's future. It does matter, and what we do matters. So this lecture series is devoted to perspectives on what we can do now to improve the prospects for the future of humanity. The Kelly Lecture Series honors the vision and compassion of Frank K. Kelly, a founder and longtime senior vice president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Frank believed deeply that everyone deserves a seat at humanity's table. He gave the first lecture in this series in 2002 on the subject, Glorious Beings, What We Are and What We May Become. Just the title of his talk, I think, gives an idea about his unbounded optimism for the future. In this lecture series, the Foundation invites a distinguished speaker each year. Recent Kelly lecturers have included Noam Chomsky, Dennis Kucinich, Daniel Ellsberg. Other lecturers in the series include Dame Anita Roddick, Francis Moore LaPay, and Nobel Peace Laureate Mairead Corrigan McGuire. You can find a complete list of the lecturers and their lectures online, as well as information on the foundation at wagingpeace.org. The Kelly Lecture is one of many projects of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Other major projects include consulting with the Marshall Islands on their nuclear zero lawsuits against the nine nuclear armed countries. The little Marshall Islands, 70,000 people on islands located in the Pacific Ocean have brought lawsuits against all of the nuclear armed countries. Uh, their David and Goliath lawsuits, they seek no compensation, but they asked the courts to order that the nuclear armed countries fulfill their obligations under international law to negotiate in good faith for an end to the nuclear arms race at an early date and for nuclear disarmament. Today, this very day, uh, March 5th, happens to be the 45th anniversary of the entry into force of the non nuclear nonproliferation treaty. So for 45 years, the United States and the other nuclear armed parties to that treaty have not fulfilled their obligations to negotiate in good faith. And the little island state of the Marshall Islands is trying to compel them to do so through lawsuits. We're very proud to stand by the side of the Marshall Islands in these lawsuits. Another important foundation project is our peace leadership program headed by Paul Chappell, a West Point graduate who travels the world training people to become peace leaders and training peace leaders to be more effective in their efforts. Right now, Paul is in Washington, D.C., where I would say there is a definite need for an infusion of peace leadership. Another of our projects is exploring the moral reasons to abolish nuclear weapons and to break the bonds of complacency 
that have led in the nuclear age to putting the future of humanity in the hands of so-called nuclear experts and policymakers, a most dangerous nuclear priesthood. The most important of these moral reasons is that we are putting all of creation at risk of extinction. Could there be a greater crime or moral shortcoming? It is the threat of the multiplication of homicide by more than seven billion humans. That is the threat that nuclear weapons pose to the planet. It is moving beyond homicide to genocide to omnicide, the death of all. Let me share with you a quote from humanistic philosopher Eric Fromm. He said, for the first time in history, the physical survival of the human race depends on a radical change of the human heart. For the first time in human history, the future of the human race depends on a radical change of the human heart. Our lecturer tonight has worked for over four decades to create this radical change in the human heart. She is a passionate and committed advocate of a nuclear weapons free world. She is a medical doctor, a pediatrician from Australia who works to save the world's children and with them, the rest of us. She has diagnosed the severe societal disease of nuclearism and has advocated its cure through nuclear abolition. Dr. Caldicott is a recipient of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's Distinguished Peace Leadership Award and has served as a member of our advisory council since 1994. She was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by two-time Nobel recipient Linus Pauling. The Smithsonian has named Helen one of the most influential women of the 20th century. She has just organized and held a vitally important symposium in New York on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. I was privileged to be one of the speakers at the symposium, which took place this past weekend at the New York Academy of Medicine. This, this this, the talks at the symposium were um, uh, taken down, with vid were videoed, and they're available online. And I encourage you to take a look if you have a chance. Uh, again, the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction is the name of the symposium. So tonight, Dr. Caldicott will be speaking on preserving humanity's future. Uh, after the lecture, we will have some time for uh, questions and answers with Dr. Caldicott. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our 2015 Kelly lecturer, Dr. Helen Caldicott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'll start, how, I'll, I'll start the lecture with how I got involved myself. Um, I was a young adolescent, aged about 16, when I read a book called On the Beach by Neville Shute, which was written by a, an Australian author. Um, it was about a nuclear war that occurred by accident in the Northern Hemisphere and everybody died. And the only people left alive in the world were people in Melbourne, which was so far south, which is where I lived. And gradually the radioactive cloud came down to Melbourne and people knew what they would be facing 
and eventually the government dispensed cyanide capsules in Burke Street outside the Queen Victoria Hospital to people so that they could kill themselves and their babies immediately instead of dying of acute radiation illness with severe nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea and bleeding to death. And the end of that book, the beautiful empty streets of Melbourne still stood. Pieces of paper were flying down in the breeze. The trams were in the centre of the street. St George was slaying the dragon outside the public library. A blind was gently flapping. And that was the end of the human race. I then went to medical school, age 17, and learned about Muller's experiments with Drosophila fruit fly, where he irradiated fruit fly and found that mutations were induced by the radiation carried on generation to generation for crooked, crooked wings and all sorts of abnormalities. And at the time, Russia and America were testing uh, nuclear hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere, irradiating millions and millions of people. For the life of me, I couldn't understand what these men were doing and why. I guess I never have. The physicists at the time knew about radiation. They knew that Madame Curie had died of aplastic anemia, where she had so much radium in her bones that her bone marrow just stopped working. She was so radioactive, they had to bury her in a kind of lead coffin. Her daughter also died of leukemia. We knew about the old radiologists who used to test the beam with their hand to see if, the, if their image was appropriate, and many of them died of cancer. We've known forever that radiation causes cancer. And, be, and you know, I sometimes would speak at the university at the refectory and the blokes would look up, I'm Australian, so I'm using Australian language, blokes would look up from their poker and say, what's that crazy Sheila talking about? So I knew that I could have no impact at university. However, I was always curious, and any article that appeared, I would read about it on nuclear weapons. I came to this country in 66 with three young children under the age of three. And I was here for three years. I got a job at Harvard Medical School, learned to treat cystic fibrosis, the commonest fatal genetic disease of childhood, uh, with the pioneer, Harry Schwachman. Um, and it was a fantastic time in America where democracy was really working. Civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War, um, Martin Luther King was shot, Bobby Kennedy was shot. I got up one hot Boston morning and turned on the television and there he was, lying, bleeding to death. Nixon was elected, clearly a paranoid man. Uh, but I saw democracy in action and Australia's a democracy, but polite and very nice. And so it, it really um, enlivened me. And then, then I read Germaine Greer, uh, the female eunuch, and I thought, when I read that, can I say that, do that, be that? And from that time on, I always sp spoke my truth, never to please anybody, but being who I was. So that was very liberating. <laughs> And I thank Germaine Greer for writing that book. She's an Australian, incidentally. <laughs> and then um, I was uh, told in, that the French were blowing up bombs in the Pacific and we got a high fallout in Adelaide and our water was radioactive and I wrote a letter to the paper saying children could get leukaemia from the radiation and they didn't publish it. So I read, I rang up the editor and said, where's my letter? And he said, well, madam, in a very condescending way, because Australian men are very condescending to women, we get hundreds of letters a day. And I said, yes, but mine's important. And I talked him through it and he published it. That night, I was on television. And every time the French blew up another bomb, I was on television talking about fallout, radiation, cancer and the like, and children being so sensitive to radiation. And um, I didn't know, but the Australians don't like the French. They think they're arrogant. I've got a French son-in-law who's actually a count. And my daughter's a countess, which is really strange. And I've got three qu quite mad half-French grandchildren who are lovely. Anyway, so they, the Australian people are furious. They stopped buying French 
French cheese and French wine. They wouldn't deliver French mail. And eventually, our Prime Minister was forced to take France to the International Court of Justice, and she was forced to test underground. So I saw what your wonderful President Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And that's the essence of where we have to be today. This democracy, well, it's not really a democracy, it's an autocracy or corptocracy at the moment, um, is totally, almost totally ignorant almost totally ignorant about what's happening. I blame partly my fellow Australian, Rupert Murdoch, who is an extremely dangerous man and broadcast to two thirds of the world's population. Um, then, uh, then I found out Australia wanted to mine uranium. So I got around to all the unions in Australia and we're very heavily unionized. That's why our basic wage is $15 an hour and we have free medical care and I went to university free to medical school. That's called a civilized society. And, uh, and I spoke to the unions about the medical dangers of mining uranium, and because I'm a physician, I also talked about the, uh, the effect of radiation upon their testicles. That <laughs> absolutely pulled them up short. <laughs> and, uh, and the whole Australian union movement banned uranium mining transportation and exportation for five years, till we got a very bad prime minister called Bob Hawke, who said, well, we'll have the three mine policy, we'll just have three mines. And that's like saying to a patient, well, you're just a little bit pregnant, so don't worry. <laughs> Since that time, we've been mining uranium, which is wicked. Um, and then I came here, and in 78, um, most Americans I spoke to said to me, well, it's better to be dead than red. And they hate the Russians. And I thought, these people are psychotic. I couldn't understand. I said, what about the pygmies in Africa? And they said, well, they don't want to be communists either. So I've, I started Physicians for Social Responsibility, and we happened to put an ad in the New England Journal of Medicine the day after Three Mile Island melted down about the medical dangers of nuclear power. And we got about 500 members suddenly, and we were working out of a sort of a shoe closet in, in a medical practice in Harvard Square. And we grew to 23,000 physicians and 153 chapters, and we held symposia about the medical dangers of nuclear war. And the first one was at Harvard Medical School with the old fellows who used to be in the Manhattan Project who designed the bomb, who had tremendous guilt. Um, and, uh, and it was crowded, and afterwards the journalists were fascinated, and they say, what, what are doctors talking about nuclear war for? Because that's, that's a political issue. And it always had been. And we said, no, it's medical, because nuclear war will create the final medical epidemic of the human race. And that quite fascinated them. So the next morning, the Boston Globe, the Archbishop would get up, or Cardinal, or whoever it was in Boston, and see a map of Boston with the concentric circles of vaporization and destruction, which I'll describe to you in a minute. And he would think, I don't think Jesus would like this. So eventually the Catholic bishops got together and wrote a pastoral letter against nuclear war, which was very profound. And then the Methodist bishops, they wrote one too, which was even better than the, past, the, the Catholic bishop's pastoral letter. And eventually everyone got involved and I had an agent in Hollywood who put me on television with a lot of film stars because no one wants a boring old woman doctor talking about nuclear war because then people won't watch or buy the hemorrhoid cream that's, you know, that's being advertised. So, um, and she got me in vogue and life and stuff. So eventually I'd go up to the aeroplane counter to check in and the man would say, I saw you on 60 Minutes last night and you're right. An informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And at the moment the media is totally, totally irresponsible. Now, the fact is that Gorbachev saw us talking on television too about the nuclear war situation, and he decided it wasn't good for them either. Um, and I, I got to meet with Ronald Reagan in the White House, because Paddy, his daughter, had met me at the Playboy Mansion, where I was addressing a lot of film stars with Paul Newman. I'd never met Paul Newman before, but he came up to me and he kissed my hand, which was just glorious. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent said, look, these are film stars, you can be emotional tonight. You mustn't be emotional to scientists, but you can be emotional. 
she said, so I gave a talk and I said at the end, now go outside and look at the stars, which I want you to do tonight, and the full moon, and realise that we are almost certainly, as far as we know, the only life in the universe. And a tall, lanky girl came up to me and said, I want you to meet my father. I think you're the only person on earth who can change his mind. And that was Ronald Reagan. So um, she called me a day later and said, we've got an hour at the end of his working day, which was four o'clock, which was a little alarming. <laughs> and we spared in the Secret Service car to the southern portico and met in the downstairs library in which there were no books. And he came, he came in and he, didn't, he was all dithery and he didn't know where to sit. So I told him where to sit. And I said, you sit there and I'll sit here. And uh, I said, you probably don't know who I am, do you? He said, yes, you're an Australian doctor who, who doesn't like the thought of nuclear war or wants to prevent it. And I said, yes, that's true. And he said, well, our ways to prevent it differ. I believe in building more bombs. So we were off to a flying start. I'd just written my book, Missile Envy, so I was just full of facts and figures. And everything he said was wrong. Team B, CIA reports, you name it, blue-green laces. And so I would stop and correct him. And you know when he got anxious, his cheeks would flush? That's called in medicine the malar flush. So I would hold his hand and reassure him. So I developed a doctor-patient relationship with him, as one does so I could assess his IQ, which was probably about 100. <laughs> and I came out saying I thought he had impending Alzheimer's and that diagnosis was accurate. However, after that, he started to say nuclear war must never be fought and can never be won. He started working with Gorbachev. They met in Reykjavik in Iceland. And over a weekend, two mere mortals almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons. There's a precedent. And they got stuck up on Star Wars, Reagan saw, and he only talked to Edward Teller before he gave that talk. People in the Pentagon were walking around saying, what's this Star Wars stuff? Teller, well, I won't talk about him. Anyway, so Reagan saw, thought there was a big sort of shield over America and the, and the missiles would come in and bounce off. Gorbachev knew damn well it would never work. He should have said, look, have your Star Wars, but let's abolish the nuclear weapons. Thus, we lost the opportunity. At the time, well, after we, we did our campaign, not just physicians, but architects and historians, they said nuclear war will be bad for history. And anthropologists and psychologists, and even I had to address the annual morticians meeting. And I said, why? And they said, we don't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. And I said, don't worry, you'll be one yourself. And they passed a resolution against nuclear war. The Mormons did, the Southern Baptists. I just quote Jesus to them and that, that was easy. <laughs> so we had 80% of people wanting an end to the nuclear arms race. We got a million people in Central Park in 1982. You know, black lesbians from Harlem and Southern Baptists and evangelical Christians and you name it, everyone. And we were doing, we were, we were a th tremendous threat to the military-industrial complex about which Eisenhower warned us. Um, and then, uh, then Gorbachev allowed the Berlin Wall to come down and the Cold War ended. So everyone thought, thank God, and we were all so tired, we retired to our couch. Then we got George I. He was quite good. He abolished some unilaterally some nuclear weapons in Europe, which had never happened before, to allow Gorbachev to get the weapons back from the Ukraine and various other Soviet states back to Moscow so he could control them. Um, and then we got Clinton. Clinton had never been to war. You have to apparently you have to have gone to kill people to be a good president, um, but he hadn't, so he felt a bit intimidated by the Pentagon, and he had no spine. And so instead of understanding, he had 80% of American people behind him, and indeed most people in the world, because this was an international thing. We handed him the, the authority to do this on a silver platter. And Boris Yeltsin was then in the uh, Kremlin, a hardened alcoholic, a bottle of vodka before breakfast type of thing. 
He probably had Korsakoff syndrome and Wernicke's encephalopathy, which you get from being an alcoholic, but he was very compliant with America. And so Clinton could have got into Air Force One with a document, flown to Boris and said, Boris, sign here, because there was a precedent with Gorbachev and Reagan. We're going to abolish nuclear weapons. He didn't. If there's a nuclear war tonight or tomorrow, which is not an impossibility, I'll get into that in a minute, it's Clinton's legacy. And for that, I, I, you can't imagine how much I resent him. One man could have actually saved the world. And then we got, did we get George II after him? Yeah, well, say no more. <laughs> okay, where are we today? Well, we've removed, they've removed some of the nuclear weapons. Of the 16,003... 400 nuclear weapons in the world today. Russia and America own 94% of them. We held a conference. There are at least 10 hydrogen bombs targeted on New York City as I speak. There's such a redundancy of weapons, you see. So all airports are targeted. Newark, uh, LaGuardia, JFK, all the bridges are targeted. The tunnels, 10. On, on Washington, there are probably 60. On Moscow, there are probably 60. Uh, every university in this country and industrial facility, military facility, um, and every town with a population greater than 50,000 or more is targeted with at least one hydrogen bomb. You target Russia, and since the Cold War ended, for some unknown reason, the Pentagon decided to ta target China as well. So Russia targets England, Europe, Canada, Australia. We've got 54 US, 34 US bases. We're the 51st state of the United States. We've got a revolting government at the moment, worse than yours. Um, who else has targeted Japan and the United States? Now, um, so who are the real terrorists in the world? Hmm? ISIS? Ooh! Ooh, ISIS! Ooh! Who are the real terrorists? Threatening to destroy the planet with the press of the button. Russia and America, and no one talks about it. This country has led the nuclear arms race at every step except one, and Russia has blindly and stupidly co copied and followed. It is America that could lead the world to survival and sanity because Russia will not move without you. Russia will if you decide to abolish nuclear weapons. Ooh, but what if someone gets a bomb? The thinking is very masculine. And we're ahead? Oh, well, they're ahead. They've got 10,000 nuclear weapons and we've only got 9,500. It is psychotic thinking. Now, America has over a thousand hydrogen bombs on hair trigger alert. What does that mean? It means that the men in the missile silos, the men on the Trident submarines, each with huge numbers of hydrogen bombs, um, if they get a message that your satellite has picked an attack up from Russia, they radio back to Pine Gap in the middle of Australia, so we're an integral part of blowing up the world, and then that message goes to the Strategic Air Command in Omaha, Nebraska. Then they inform the Joint Chiefs and then it gets to the President. The President has three minutes to decide whether or not to press the button. And he doesn't have really much choice. It's either to destroy cities, which is called counter value, and people dying is called collateral damage by the Pentagon, or destroy the missile silos in Russia, that's called counter, counter value, counter force, and killing the missiles is very important. That's what the Pentagon says. Or do both. You'll notice when you look at the president, always walking behind him is an officer with a suitcase, and it's called the football, and that's got the codes to start a nuclear war. When he met with the Pope recently, the football was underneath the table as he spoke to the Pope to destroy God's creation. Same with Putin. When Reagan was shot, they lost the football for two days. They lost it. So the message comes through. Um, what happened, I mean, there are very many near misses. 
Flocks of geese have nearly set off the early warning system because these satellites just pick up the gleam of the sun or the moon on the hydrogen bombs traversing through space. Most missiles are moved, multiple independent re-entry vehicles, meaning you can put eight hydrogen bombs on one missile. You launch them in the launch phase, then they enter the transit phase in space and you get the bombs separate. So you've got the X missile, which is called the bus, and you've got the passengers, which are the hydrogen bombs. And so you, they, they travel through space and then there's a terminal phase and the whole thing takes half an hour. So flocks of geese have nearly set it off, the rising moon once, a faulty computer chip plugged into the Pentagon computer. Um, Norway launched a, a weather missile rocket and they told, the Pentagon told the Kremlin about this, but the Kremlin lost the data, called human fallibility. Um, and then it was picked up and they thought it was going to be a first strike, which I'll walk you through in a minute. And there's Yeltsin, hardened alcoholic, and he had three minutes to decide whether or not to press the button. And the generals are standing over his shoulder saying, press the button, Mr. President. Three seconds before the end of that three minutes elapsed, the missile veered off course. Three seconds. That's why we're sitting here. Those sort of accidents occur several times a year, if not more. The men in the missile silos that man your missiles, there are two men in each silo, aged 18 to 21, yes sir, press the button sir. Um, they each have a pistol, one to shoot the other if one shows signs of deviant behaviour. So who might use the pistol first? They have the locks to, to launch the missile are 12 feet apart, but they've worked out if they tie a string, one man can launch the missile with three hydrogen bombs on it. They're called Minutemen missiles. At the moment, those missile stations are operated by floppy disks, and the telephones often don't work. And it, over the last year, over 70 men have been discharged and fired because they've been taking drugs down there. They go to sleep, they're cheating, or they're inappropriate. Because it's not sexy anymore to be manning missile silos. You don't get very far in the Air Force when you're just sitting there all day waiting to blow up the planet. I've met their girlfriends. Some of them take drugs before they go down. I don't know what goes on in the Russian missile silos, but you can just imagine. The Russian soldiers used to be such hardened alcoholics, they used to drink the antifreeze liquid out of their tanks. Okay, so what happens... Well, here you are in Santa Barbara. You've got Vandenberg Air Force Base just up the road. That would be targeted with at least... I don't know, five, ten bombs, H-bombs. You've got, um, what else, David? Another a military facility near here, right? What? Yeah, okay, that's targeted. You've got a university here, that's targeted. Diablo Canyon's targeted, of course, which makes, can you imagine, the fallout. So, just imagine... We're sitting here, and you know you're listening to NPR sometimes and hear, ooh, and a man with a deep voice will say, this is just a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Well, the man would say, this is not a test. We're under nuclear attack. Run to the nearest fallout shelter. But you'd only have five minutes to get there by the time this all happens. And as your early warning system picks up the missiles, the Russian, early, and you will press the button, the Russian early warning system, well, in fact, it doesn't work anymore. The only early warning system they have is over the horizon radar. They just see the bombs coming in at the last second. Does that make the Russians paranoid? Oh, yes, it does. So the weapon will come in. Let's say we've got a I'm going to drop a 20 megaton bomb. It's very big. The Russian bombs are very big, much bigger than yours, and yours, of course, you're targeted with the Russian bombs um, because you're targeted with quite a few bombs. So I'll sort of combine it with a 20 megaton bomb. It will land here at, at 20 times the speed of sound. You won't hear a thing. It will explode here with 
six, I don't know, 20 times the heat inside the centre of the sun. E equals mc squared. It will dig a hole three quarters of a mile wide and 800 feet deep, turning us, the buildings and everything to radioactive fallout shot up in the mushroom cloud. Five miles from the centre, everyone is vaporised. A little boy in Hiroshima was re reaching up to catch a red dragonfly on his hand against the blue of the sky and there was a blinding flash and he disappeared and left his shadow on the pavement. And if you go to Hiroshima, you'll see that shadow in the museum. It's the first time that man's developed a mechanism to vaporise his fellow human beings. Out to 20 miles, everyone is lethally burnt. The White House has been stockpiling large quantities of morphine, just in case it's a nuclear war, but we don't know where it is. And we, physicians, will all be similarly dead or injured. There'll be no hospitals. Um, people will be sucked out of buildings with winds at 500 miles an hour turned into missiles travelling at 100 miles an hour. Pieces of glass travelling at 100 miles an hour will decapitate people. The Pentagon's got a book called The Effects of Nuclear War, like how far a piece of glass travelling at 100 miles an hour will, will penetrate human flesh. This is your Pentagon, you own it and you pay for it and it's a socialised system. This country is really a socialised country for the Pentagon military industrial complex of the tune of $1 trillion a year and the, and the nuclear, and nuclear uh, power industry. It's really a socialised country. Your tax dollars go to killing and not for your health care and you should have free health care, all of you. That's your right. <laughs> then there'll be a huge conflagration a firestorm of 3,000 square miles where everything will burn. Rubber and oil refineries and wood and huge amounts will be thrown up into the stratosphere. And as that happens, there will be a, a, coal a coalition, no, a coalescence of fires across America and America will burn coast to coast, north to south and also into Canada. That's what we discussed this weekend with really the top experts. The, the Pentagon knows all about this, but it's a, you know, it's definitely a possibility. Um, now, America's got a policy for a first strike winnable nuclear war, and how do you win a nuclear war? Well, first you send a missile over to Moscow and you decapitate Moscow. Notice the language. It's using human physiology and anatomy for for targets. So you decapitate Moscow, so you kill Putin and he can't press his button. Then you launch your missiles and you need two hydrogen bombs landing on each Russian missile silo and they have to land at a certain interval because if they land too late, the second one coming in will develop fratricide because so much debris is thrown up by the first one, the other one won't work. So it's got to be perfectly timed and you've worked all that out because America is very smart. Um, so you destroy all their missile silos. Now, that means you win the nuclear war, but you'll all die too from radioactive fallout and nuclear winter, which I'll get into in a minute. But it's okay. I mean, you know, you've won the nuclear war. You've destroyed their missiles, but you're all going to die anyway. So the Russians, they don't want you to win a nuclear war. So they've dug a big, big cave in the Ural Mountains, and they've got a rocket there, and if they pick up your missiles coming in after decapitation in Moscow... They send up this missile and it's called the Dead Hand. And it sends a message via radio to all the missiles to be launched with no human input. Did you, did you know that? See, why didn't you? This is your world. This is your world. So what happens after a nuclear war? Well, you can imagine, I mean... People can get into shelters. Uh, you can't come out for six months because the radiation is so intense. But they thought the Pentagon's been planning, or FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, sending the old people out to collect food because we won't live long enough to get our cancers. Um, if you are in a fallout shelter and the bomb drops, you'll be asphyxiated as people were in Dresden as the fire uses up all the oxygen. Um, 
and the ultraviolet, the, the um, ozone will be totally destroyed, so you can stay out in the sun for three minutes and you'll get third degree sunburn and go blind. Uh, and th the cloud in the stratosphere will cover the Earth for up to 10 years or longer, creating a short ice age and everyone will freeze to death in the dark. Maybe the cockroaches might live and maybe the algae, we don't know. But certainly we will not, or any warm-blooded creatures, and most of the 30 million other species that cohabit the planet with us will die. Now, what have we got today? The Russians are sort of come gung-ho at the moment, saying, well, we, we can have a nuclear war. Commentators on television are saying that. What's America done in the Ukraine? What has America done since Gorbachev ended the Cold War? Well, it was promised at that meeting, and I think it was between George I and Gorbachev, I'm not sure, but it was promised orally that America would not expand NATO. NATO is America. NATO was set up actually to fight North American Air Command to fight the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union no longer exists. But NATO is America. So um, what happened? Well, the military industrial complex were terribly upset when the Cold War ended because they can't build their weapons. There was no reason to build them anymore. Lockheed Martin, I mean, they make billions and billions of dollars from your tax, tax dollars. How dare they? This country is all about killing. You, the biggest industries, are about killing. Thou shalt not kill. Look at all the wars you've been involved in since the Second World War. So what happened was Norman Augustine, who kind of runs the Pentagon and was the head of Lockheed Martin, the biggest military industrial corporation, he took himself off to Lithuania, Latvia and all these little countries that have been liberated from the Soviet Union. And he convinced them to join NATO because if you join NATO, you have to militarise up to the tune of $3 billion and buy their lousy F-35s and all their stuff, you know? And so he said, you'll have a democracy, you'll have freedom of speech and, of course paying all that money, these poor little countries, you can imagine. So what America has done on purpose, orchestrated by the neocons in the State Department, et al., is taken NATO right up to the border of Russia. How dare they? And it was to sell their blasted weapons. And can you imagine how Russia feels? You remember what you did when there were a few nuclear missiles in Cuba? You nearly blew up the world. You did. And I knew Robert McNamara, who was in the Oval Office at the time, Secretary of Defence for JFK, and he said, Helen, you don't know how close we came to within minutes of destroying the planet. So imagine if Russia moved into Canada and said, well, now um, Canada's part of uh, Russia now. America would go ballistic and it would blow up the world. How incredibly arrogant this country is and how stupid not understanding other people's psyche. The Russians lost 30 million people in the Second World War. Leningrad, they starved for three years. I've been to the cemetery at Leningrad and you walk down and there are mass graves on either side and people bring bread to leave on the graves. And there's a statue of Mother Russia at the end and Bach's double violin concerto is playing softly as you walk down. I can remember I was a little girl in my kitchen in Melbourne when Mum said, he's turned on Russia. Thank God he'll never beat Russia. And the Second World War was run, won on the Russian front. Russia were your allies during the Second World War. You fought together. You blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki to show the Russians that you had the bomb so they couldn't move into Japan and you were going to be superior. That's why you did it. I'm saying you because it's a collective you. So you don't have to feel bad yourself, but this is your country. So now, the Ukraine. 
America, the State Department gave the Ukraine $5 billion. There was a president who was elected called Yanukovych. He was a bit corrupt, but most people, most leaders are, let's be frank. And the EU wanted the Ukraine to join the EU, European Union. And he talked with uh, Putin about this. And it, if that happened, and then they'd also part, come part of the IMF, they'd lose $160 billion, I think, and they had to tighten their belts. You know, that's what Greece has had to do, you know, austerity, and people are out of work and the like. Um, and so, and, but Yeltsin, I mean, Putin understood, and he was going to lend money to Yanukovych, and Yanukovych was going to go to an election at the end of the year about this issue. Meanwhile, Victoria Newland from your State Department, a neocon, whose husband is Robert Kagan, a major neocon, went to um, the Ukraine, handed out cookies to the crowd, and decided they'd like someone else to be president, and they fomented or fomented the... Um, demonstrations which got quite violent and there was a sniper shooting people. No one knows who the sniper was. And Yanukovych fled. So America put in a man called um, Poroshenko and he's your puppet. Like Saddam Hussein was your puppet. He worked for the CIA since he was 21 in the Ukraine. Like the Shah of Iran was your puppet. Like uh, Muammar Gaddafi was kind of your puppet. And I, I can go on and on. Hmm? So now we've got a puppet government and NATO is going to go in and arm the Ukrainian forces. Now, but the people in eastern the Ukraine, they're Russians and they speak Russian and they don't want really to lose their culture and their language and everything and they call them the rebels. And the New York Times has been pumping this up like they pumped up the war against Iraq by printing five full page, five front page articles by Judith Miller, who was actually sleeping with Scooter Libby, to say that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. They apologised later, but the New York Times allowed that war to occur and America killed over a million people in Iraq, half of whom were children. And I speak now as a paediatrician. That country is in total chaos and ISIS has emerged from that chaos because it was a a tribalised country, they're tribes and they all, you know, the ancient histories. But once the control is removed and chaos assumes and there is sewage running down the streets and there are no hospitals and America broke into the hospitals and even shot surgeons operating in the operating rooms, um, chaos ensues, as it is in Libya now. So... Here's Ukraine, and they call the, the, the Russian-speaking people rebels. And they're going to arm the Poroshenko and stuff. Now, Russia has over a 1,000 hydrogen bombs on hair trigger alert targeted on you. It's said that um, Putin has put his weapons on a higher than normal state of alert. At 9-11, no one knew what was happening, so... The weapons alert went from DEFCON 5, 4, 3, 2, and the last one is press the button, because no one knew what was happening. George Bush was flying around in an aeroplane, having been reading that book to the kindergarten children about something, someone's goat or something, but the book was upside down. <laughs> and Cheney was in the basement of the White House. I mean, you wouldn't trust him as far as you could kick him. Um, and, and so that's what happens at, at times of high international anxiety, which is now. And Russia's paranoid. Now, you don't threaten paranoid patients because they're likely to do something very dangerous to themselves or you. I mean, I have, I've had paranoid patients. I won't go into it, but they, they threaten me, chase me around the house. When I was trying to control this man and try and inject some chlorpromazine into his buttocks so he could calm down. And he was very rude to me. I mean, it's scary. Okay, so that's the Ukraine. God knows what's going to happen and it gets worse by the day and no one here really understands how they feel and how Russia feels. 
And instead of negotiating with them and understanding and sort of being like a psychiatrist to see where they're at and their history and, and what's going on and talking to them, as we did for years and years because they were friends, we're poking the Russian bear in the eyes with needles. Then there's Iran. Now, Physicians for Social Responsibility did a study, I think in 2006, um, the Bouchier reactor is a 1,000 megawatt reactor. Uh, that's big, and you can be sure all the nuclear, nuclear reactors are targeted anyway in a nuclear war. They all melt down anyway. Natanz and Isfahan have facilities for uranium enrichment and uranium making fuel rods and stuff buried deep, deep underground. The only way to knock them out, if you're Israel, is with hydrogen bombs. So they did a scenario with two, three hydrogen bombs, um, B61-11s, targeted on Natanz and Isfahan. I've been to Iran, it's a beautiful country. They're Persians, all their streets are named after poets. Um, you put in the Shah of Iran, who's a wicked man, you were selling him, giving him nuclear power plants, you had listening posts listening into uh, Russia, and then they, he got overthrown by the Ayatollah from Paris, and then, you know, they took the hostages and no one should take American hostages, how they, dare they? And from that time on, we've got a much more moderate na man now, I think he's called Khomeini, and, and John Kerry, who I know, uh, he's a family friend. He's really doing his best, I think, to negotiate a treaty. But if, if those two underground facilities were attacked with uh, three hydrogen bombs each, which they would do, it would kill 2.6 million people in the first 48 hours, all the way over to Pakistan and India, and 10 million people would later die of acute radiation illness. Did Netanyahu mention that fact? Because all the radioactive uranium and the like would be released, plus the fallout from the hydrogen bombs. No one talks about people suffering and getting sick. No one talks about human beings. I don't understand it, but you do know that Israel has at least 200 hydrogen bombs, which she will neither confirm nor deny, how dare she, in an area where there are a lot of enemies. And, you know, she's saying to people, we've got them all, you can't have them. And people say, well, who do you think you are? It's like America. We've got them all. North Korea can't have one. Oh, no, we can't trust them because they're not a stable government. Yet America has a policy to exterminate life on the planet. It's a Pentagon policy. And it's driven by the military-industrial complex so that they can make trillions and squillions of dollars from you and steal your tax dollars so you don't have a free medical care system. Now, what are you going to do about it? We're at a stage where I said to my family... I'll be home if it's not a nuclear war. We're on the cusp. And I haven't felt like this very often. In fact, I don't know if I ever have. I can't see any hope at the moment because no one's awake. The New York Times is leading this. Putin's a rotten bastard, you know, and... Uh, and the Washington Post and the or stupid Murdoch. Why aren't they understanding what this is about? We are the curators of life on Earth, the only life in the universe. We hold it in the palm of our hand. It took billions of years for life to evolve on this incredibly beautiful planet. It was Einstein who said, the splitting of the atom changed everything, save man's mode of thinking, all reality. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe, but we're not drifting now, we're rushing towards it. 
What can you do? Well, I can only take my example. I came here, I was a rusty doctor, I was an alien, and I was a woman. But I didn't want to have a nuclear war, and I was really worried about America's attitude towards Russia. And so I started Physicians for Social Responsibility, and we led the movement. We led the nuclear weapons freeze, and we got 80% of people behind us because we educate people. Now, what I'm going to say to you, and I want you to take it really seriously, because you've heard what I said tonight. The hope lies in your heart and soul. The only person you can change is you. If you love your children, if you love your grandchildren, if you love the wisteria that's coming out and the roses, you will take it upon yourself to use this democracy, which it really is open to be used, to save the planet. You will get to see the president if necessary. You will do whatever it takes. You'll go and see the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You will go and see your senators who are your representatives and you are their leaders. The president is your representative, not your leader. That's all I can say. I don't know what else to say, but it's about love. And I've often treated men who've lived quite wicked lives, made cruise missiles and stuff, and on their deathbed or when the children are dying, they open up and tell me all the wicked things they've done. But it's too late. And I've delivered many babies. These beautiful, beautiful souls come out so pure. And that purity and wisdom and knowledge is inherent in every single one of us throughout our lives if we tap into it. So this is the ultimate test of our humanity and who we are. Good luck and thank you.